All right, uh, so we have two main products. One is Chirp, is a C++ WebAssembly and JavaScript compiler. And the other is ChipJ, is a solution to run Java and WebAssembly and JavaScript. And today I'm gonna to talk about our third project that is ChirpBase. So first, let me clarify what I mean by running any application in the browser. We just need to see the browser and just another architecture and operating system. So in order to run an application in it, we just need two main pieces. Uh, an execution engine, so something that can run our code. And in the case of the browser, it's JavaScript and WebAssembly are our native code. And also we need to access uh, system capabilities, some lower level libraries that actually show something on the screen. Otherwise, it's just making computation without showing anything. And so, for example, how do we run a C++ application in a browser? I guess that most of you know about mscripten, and Chirp is another uh, C++ compiler. So in this case, we take C++ source code, and we compile it to WebAssembly and JavaScript. And then we also need to implement some lower level API. So for example, the POSIX API, SDL for showing graphics on the screen. And we need to implement those with uh, JavaScript, uh, if you use a script, and which actually you can use C++ also for the JavaScript side. But anyway, you need to do this kind of work. And this is just uh, a demo to illustrate this. This is a game I ported with Chirp. It's uh, called T-Words. It's a C++ multiplayer game. And in this case, uh, we need to implement uh, the OpenGL. And this game runs with OpenGL 1, so there is some work to do to make it work with uh, WebGL, because it doesn't map really one-to-one. -one. Also, this game is multiplayer, so it uses UDP for networking, and you don't have that in the browser. But if you emulate somehow, in this case, I use WebRTC, uh, you can make it work. And the nice thing about this demo is that since I use WebRTC, both client and server run in the browser, so you can just run everything in your browser. You can go to that web page if you want to try it. But uh, what if I want to run a Java application? For example, in this case, you can use ChirpJ, and ChirpJ compiles Java bytecode, not source code, into JavaScript, and it supports uh, in this way like all the JVM languages because they are all compiled to the same bytecode, and uh, we also support all the Java features, so reflection, multiplayer, dynamic cross loading, and for the library side of things, what we do is we compile the OpenJDK. Uh, into WebAssembly and JavaScript. And this way, we can run uh, unmodified application, for example, that use Gwing or AWT, these kind of things. And I also have an example of that. If it runs. Yeah, <laughs> live demos, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, called Open Aztec. It was a Java applet, and it visualizes 3D uh, molecules like protein and stuff like that. And yeah, it was a Java applet, but I don't have Java, uh, a Java plugin in this browser. It just runs out of the box with uh, ChipJ. But yeah, I promise you to run any application. So I, we cannot just implement or every single runtime, what if we just run a Linux self binary and solve the problem? So let's try to do that. So yeah, I have a very simple uh, C program. I can compile it. Uh, you can see I have a couple of flags here, a static, it's just because so I have one file that I can drop in the browser later, and M32 is because we support only 32 bit for now. So I can run this and I can check that it's actually an ELF 32 bit executable. And I can just choose it from here and it runs the browser. So, what did I just do? <laughs> So what is ChirpX exactly? Uh, ChirpX is a generic, robust, and scalable technology to run binary code in the browser. It's written in C++ and compiled to WebAssembly. 
and it features a two-tier execution engine. So there is an interpreter and a JIT compiler. And it also supports two different runtimes. So you just saw a uh, Linux application running, but we also support running a full system with an operating system on top. Uh, so this is a schematic of uh, uh, the execution engine. So we have a thread schedule that calls into the interpreter. And uh, if the code that we want to run is compiled, the interpreter just skip and uh, run the WebAssembly code directly. And if something happens, for example, there is a timer, if, um, uh, an hardware fault, or a syscall, we can just go back to the interpreter again and restart the cycle. And uh, the idea is that a code that, uh, code that is uh, rarely executed can just go in the interpreter, and code that is executed a lot is compiled to WebAssembly. And so uh, x86 is has a pretty large number of opcodes. And what we actually do is we decompose these opcodes in primitives. So this is an example. This is an add instruction. And we decompose it to this, it's uh, building blocks. So like loading the arguments from an immediate register or uh, from an immediate register, then do the actual add operation that includes uh, computing the flags because in the hardware, uh, every arithmetic operation automatically computes the flags, and we don't have that in WebAssembly, so we need to manually compute the flags, and then store the result. And here is another example. So this is a compare instruction. It's actually a subtraction uh, where we don't care about the result, but only the flags. So uh, the interpreter, like I said, executes uh, one instruction at a time. And while doing that, it also builds some uh, auxiliary structures useful for jitting the code later. So mainly the control flow graph of the program. So we discover uh, where all the code goes um, uh, while we run it. And also we, um, uh, we, we check where the indirect jumps go, so usually and indirect jumps always go to the same place, so we, we know this kind of information and we can use it later. And so this control flow graph uh, is made of traces. They're also called basic blocks in um, other contexts. And there is a linear sequence of instructions which are on a branch or a call. So a linear sequence and then you go somewhere else. So this is just a, a visual explanation of how this works. Imagine this is like the uh, memory of the x86 binary, so this is just code. We don't really know what's in there at the beginning. And this code at some point will jump some other places. So this is like, imagine it can jump anywhere it wants, and we track that information and we build this uh, control flow graph of these traces. And so when it Tra uh, when a trace is uh, hot enough, so it's, it's been run uh, enough times, uh, we decide to compile it to WebAssembly. But there is a problem here. Uh, how do we run WebAssembly? We just run functions. So you cannot just run a, piece, a random piece of code. You have to put your code in a function. And what is a function in native code? I mean, there are the call and write instructions. So you can say that a function is something that is a target of a call, and it then when you get the right instruction, but the code is actually not required to do that at all. It can do whatever it wants. You can have a right instruction without a call or any other thing. You can have code that self modifies. And so what we actually do, we just uh, discover what a function could be uh, with the control flow information that we uh, got in the interpreter. So for example, here we have the control flow graph of, the big, of before. And let's say the code runs a bit, and after some time, this, function, this uh, trace gets warm, this trace gets warm, and eventually one trace will become hot, and this is the entry point of our WebAssembly function. And this trace and all the traces that are reachable from that one, that are at least warm, will become their own WebAssembly function. And so we can plug that one back in, and it will be much faster because we don't have to go to the interpreter to, to, to run that. And what if 
another trace is becomes uh, warm or hot in the meantime well we can just uh, after some time, we can decide to update our function and hot plug it again. And yeah, so that's the basic idea of, of it. Uh, we also run some optimization passes um, when we co just compile the code. And our core assumption is that the code is already optimized, right? Because it has been compiled by the, the, the source language. And so the code is already, let's say, optimal but we want to optimize all the overhead of the virtualization. So for example, a very significant optimization that we can do is uh, avoid to, comp to compute the flex register that I told you before, because most of the time they are not really needed. So for example, let me show you what I mean. Uh, let's say that we have an add instruction uh, immediately followed by a sub instruction, right? So those are our primitives, one after the other. And if if we look uh, after the add plus flags instruction, we have a flag store. And then we have another flag store there, but nobody reads the flags in the, in the middle. So it's useless to compute them. And we can know this and we can just remove that operation and compile more efficient code. We can also, you see, uh, remove other things that are not useful, for, so we are ready loaded the value of ABX, so we don't need to do that again, and stuff like this. Uh, yeah, we also support uh, multi-threading, uh, and the way we do it is there is actually one real thread in the main thread of the, uh, of the browser process, and we do uh, time slicing, so we allocate some, some time slots for, for a logical thread to run, and we can just, uh, uh, do some round robin or other scheduling. Um, and we also su support Linux processes. We, they are just like threads, but with other space that is not shared. And eventually we want to support to run uh, real parallelism. So having more than one uh, web worker running our code, but uh, it's not implemented yet. Uh, yeah, system calls. So, uh, for ChipX, our low-level libraries are actually system calls, and uh, we need to uh, catch uh, the system call where they are invoked, and uh, uh, we implement them uh, using the browser APIs. So we implement, uh, for example, file system-related system calls, like open, a secret, write, close, also timing-related ones, memory management, so we can map memory pages, and several others. Uh, yeah, there are some uh, limitations that we are hitting uh, uh, on the current implementation of WebAssembly. Uh, so for example, uh, what I explained so far is not so different than what uh, software like QEMU does natively, for example, right? They just generate some code and they jump into it and, and but we cannot do that in WebAssembly. So we cannot just generate some WebAssembly code and jump into it. That's not how it works. You need to put it into a module, then you compile the module, and this is an asynchronous operation, so you need to wait some time, and then you have your module and you can call the functions inside the module. And there is a trade-off here, because uh, ideally we would like one function per module. So as soon as we want to compile one function, we put it into a module, and we compile it so it will be super fast because it's just one function. But we cannot do that unfortunately because uh, browsers uh, currently have some limitations. For example, Chrome, af after we have like 1,000 modules uh, at the same time, it just the, bra the tab crashes. <laughs> so yeah, we need to batch the functions. Uh, so one module will contain a certain number of functions. But if there are too many, the compilation will take some time and there is latency and we, are, we don't want to spend too much time in the interpreter if we know that the code is out. So we need to carefully balance this. And there are other problems. So for example, we found some memory leaks in modules if we uh, share uh, function tables, for example. Uh, yeah, so it's still a bit rough, but hopefully the, this will improve uh, without doing anything. 
we also depend on some uh, wasm experimental features. So uh, right now, mainly uh, threads and shared array buffer. So I told you that we are not really using threads for running uh, the virtual threads, but we do use them, uh, for example, to schedule interrupts, uh, to keep time, and other things. Also, we use wasm tail calls. That is currently a, an experimental feature. And this is useful to implement indirect branches. Uh, without this, if you implement indirect branches with normal calls, you will end up blowing up the stack. Uh, and with this, it's, it works. And, and right now, they are support, uh, this is supported in Chrome, uh, still not in Firefox, but it will come eventually. And yeah, so we can run any application, but we need to adapt what our expectations are. For example, we cannot expect the application to access the file system of, of the computer it's running on because there is a sandbox in the browser. So we provide a sandboxed file system uh, with the index FDB. And also there are networking limitations. So if the, an application is just opening a random network port, like let's say a new DP port, we, we cannot actually do that because the browser doesn't expose that. Uh, so we can try to work around that with web sockets, but web sockets are not real sockets. So you still need some kind of proxy server that relays uh, the web sockets traffic. Uh, HTTP requests are mostly fine, but there are cross origins problems. Uh, that can happen, so yeah, it's still not uh, uh, so immediate to, to have everything working, but it can be done. Uh, yeah, uh, so you may wonder, what, oh, right, this is all cool, but what is the use case of this, right? <laughs> uh, well, the main use case for now has been uh, trying to run the uh, Adobe Flash Player uh, in, the, in the browser without the plugin, so as you may know, uh, this year, uh, support for Flash will, will, will end, but there are still a lot of uh, Flash applications out there, and there is some effort to re-implement the uh, Flash player, so there is stuff like Raffle, for example. But, yeah, we believe that we will never get there when there is actual feature parity, so even before Raffle, there was the Gnash project, there were uh, the LightSpark project, and actually uh, my boss is the original author of LightSpark and he's convinced that this is the only way to have everything working uh, for real. And yeah, because we just run the original and uh, nothing can go wrong, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a little uh, explanation of how it works because Flash is not an application, it's a shared library. So you need the NOST application to load the shared library and provide an API. Uh, it's the Pepper API that was designed by the Chrome team originally. And so we need uh, a NOST application that is compiled to x86 and lives alongside uh, the Flash player. And but half of it is actually outside and it communicates with the, the one inside the VM. And the second part is JavaScript and it, it implements uh, the Pepper API using the web APIs. Uh, so hopefully, uh, you, uh, the, how can you use this? You just include our script. Our script will find all the objects, tags in the page and replace them uh, with canvases. Uh, controlled by our runtime and everything will work magically. And if you don't believe me, I actually have an example here. So let me make this a little bit bigger. <laughs> so yeah, this is a flash game. <laughs> Pretty shitty one, if you ask me, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you see, it's not super fast yet, but 
it works. So it's kind of incredible if you ask me that this is actually running. <laughs> and yeah, there you have it. Let's die. <laughs> So uh, as I told you at the beginning, we also have uh, another uh, mode that is the full system emulation. So in this case, we don't emulate the syscalls, but uh, we emulate the hardware and we can run uh, an operating system on top. Right now, we can run uh, DOS. We still cannot run like real protected mode, but uh, we're working on that. And the execution engine is the same. So the JIT, uh, the interpreter, that's exactly the same. And I also have a demo of that. So this is DOS. And who knows prehistoric? <laughs> it's a nice old style game. And this is actually pretty nice speed, I think. It's <laughs> yeah. So what are we thinking about the future of this? So as you just saw, the performance is promising, but we are still not there, uh, especially for Flash. There is still a little uh, 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 lags. Uh, but we think that our approach with the two-tier engine is actually scalable and robust, and we can do more optimization, and we can improve on this. And we actually already have uh, an agreement with the uh, uh, Flash Game distributor to uh, deploy this uh, on actual websites. And there is also interest for enterprise software using frameworks like, uh, like Flex and Spark that are uh, Flash frameworks for doing uh, enterprise applications. And we have an early adopter program, so if, if you've bought it, any reason you have Flash in your company, you can <laughs> contact us and we can help you probably. Uh, we expect to have uh, satisfying performance by the summer, hopefully. And we think that this work is very general. So right now Flash is our focus, but we think that may be uh, other cool application of this and we, we look into that if we find something else. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it. And you can get in touch with me. There's my email. And you can learn more uh, about our company. That's the website. And also, we are hiring. So if you are interested in this kind of technology, uh, let us know. We have plenty of time for questions. So. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That was super cool to see. Um, uh, the uh, jitting WebAssembly uh, story, you know, we all know it's possible. Like, oh, yeah, you know, you just blat out some bytes for a module and then instantiate it and then export a function to call it. You know, what could go wrong? Um, but obviously, there's a lot of room to make that a lot better. Um, and I know that a lot of people in the CG are very interested in making a uh, sort of JIT proposal um, and, and getting first class support for JITing WebAssembly oh, functions. Very nice. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is definitely the most robust uh, WebAssembly JITing system I have seen yet. So I think your experience with that would be very useful to hear about uh, in the CG. Um, and uh, so hopefully we can get a proposal started in that direction. Yeah, I will be in, uh, also tomorrow there. So if anybody wants to speak with me about that, I'm happy to do that. Perfect. So yeah, there you go. Um, so there's a lot of Flash websites that you can find on the web archives. Is there any way that we can use this to maybe like automatically make those sites work in Chrome? Yeah, so in principle, yes. Uh, the only thing that's needed to make this work is to inject our script into a web page containing a, a Flash app. And yeah, 
ideally okay. should work. Right now, not everything works. A, a lot of things actually crash the runtime, so I show you cool demos that actually work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, everything is doable and it will improve. And yeah, that's cool. the idea. So the original website has no idea that Chirp is yeah, there. In that case, we can still do something. So for example, for our uh, Java product, we actually have a Chrome extension that is called uh, Chirp J Applet Runner. And you can use that extension to inject our script. If, so if in, even if the website uh, is, hasn't added our uh, script there, you can just use the extension and eventually we will do something similar to this. Cool. I'm curious how you uh, handle garbage collection, given that you can't inspect the Wasm stack. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I assumed a lot of knowledge there. Uh, so most uh, garbage collectors that I'm familiar with will basically scan the stack. So I'm thinking mostly about the, the Java. Um, oh. The Chirp J. So I'm wondering oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. if that is a problem, or did you work around it somehow? So, uh, for Chip J, uh, the Java code is compiled to JavaScript, and we use the JavaScript garbage collector. The WebAssembly parts of Chip J are the native methods that are compiled to WebAssembly, while the Java stuff right now is in JavaScript. Hopefully, when the uh, GC will be implemented for WebAssembly, we can move also that part to WebAssembly. But right now, we don't ship our own garbage collector. OK, that makes sense. So basically, the Java garbage collector is utilizing the JavaScript yes, garbage collector. Correct. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Great, great talk. This is super cool. Hello. Um, even before this meetup just a few weeks ago, I wanted to run a Java applet in my browser, and I discovered you and was glad to uh, find your uh, Chirp J. Um, Extension. I just wanted to ask, uh, why does it only work under as a Chrome extension right now? And Sorry? Why does the Chirp J only work as a Chrome extension and not other? Oh, yeah. Well, platforms? actually, there is nothing that prevents us from making a Firefox extension, too. But so there are a lot of workarounds that we put into the extension because we need to uh, inject our stuff very, very early. And the APIs for uh, extensions are not really letting us do all the stuff that we want. So there are some workarounds that are Chrome specific, and we could do that for Firefox too. But yeah, you know, we have uh, all, only so many people working on this. And, okay, just uh, time. Yeah, more okay, people thanks. use Chrome. So I would love to do it for Firefox, but yeah, it's not. It's not there yet. It's probably work out of the box, but I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, so you were talking about traces, that you uh, analyze the language, uh, the front end language, and compile it into traces, which is nice. And I was wondering, so when you are running the JIT, you're running on actual values, like that are uh, with which you ex execute the program, basically. And with these values, you could actually uh, perform some certain optimizations that um, modify or mutate this trace uh, graph. Are you using these optimizations during the chitting? Oh, I, I didn't understand which kind of optimization. It might be a little bit too technical, to be honest. But um, so during execution of actual values, you have concrete values during execution. Yeah. That you do not know upon compilation time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see. I see okay. what you mean. Yeah. No, we are not. We are not doing that. But that's actually a, a cool thing to explore. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Okay. That could be done. Uh, but yeah, we are not doing that yet. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I was curious when you're doing your full one where you're saying you can run DOS or, or, a, or a Linux binary. Are you able to open a socket? Um, it's something I've been kind of working on with WASM stuff at the moment. So the question is... If we are you able to open like a raw socket? To like run a web server inside of... If, if I had a Linux binary that, that's a web server. So yeah. Uh, 
So we are still, uh, I, network is not implemented right now. Uh, and one reason is the problem that I told you before. So the, applic if the application is opening a row socket. We have to somehow map that to what we have at our disposal. And that yeah. is either web sockets or web RTC, like I did with this. Yeah, that, that is game. exactly the issue I run into. But you have to decide, for example, if you use web RTC, then you are confining yourself to uh, only communicate with other applications that use the same WebRTC backend. So you yeah. cannot, so let's say that you have one application, one instance of the application running inside the browser and another one running natively to another person's computer. They cannot communicate if we yeah. implement with WebSockets. And so the way you could do that is you, we could implement it with WebSockets and have some kind of relay server. And the relay server use normal sockets and in this way you can communicate between the native one and the browser yeah. one. But if you don't care about that, maybe you just want browser processes, like for Flash, maybe you want multiplayer games. Mm -hmm. In this case, WebRTC makes more sense, maybe, because in this case, we don't need a, a proxy. Yeah. We can just do like the P-Worlds demo. So we still have to think about that, and maybe the best thing is just a case-by-case -case, uh, scenario. OK. Um, question for anyone on the Chrome team. Do you have any status on the Fugu raw connection stuff or the ability to no, no, no Chrome ease? There's a, there's a project Fugu, which is Chrome is trying to bring a lot of the, the Chrome, um, Chrome OS APIs to the native platform. And one of them that I actually have been following is the raw, raw connection. So be able to do sockets and UDP. And I don't think it's very far along last day. Yeah, there was one in Firefox OS, but that's separated right. now. And, and Chrome apps has it, but it, yeah. I think that also, uh, uh, um, Chrome apps can open sockets, but yeah, those are not anywhere, everywhere. So. But maybe one day. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Oh, uh, do you mind? It's faster this way. Hey, uh, really cool talk. You mentioned that your goal is to run flash files. Um, why did you implement an x86 interpreter rather than a flash interpreter? That's a good question. Uh, but uh, yeah, like, like I mentioned, we could implement, re implement the flash uh, uh, virtual machine, let's say. And there are projects that did this. So yeah. in, back in the day, there was the Gnash pro project, and there was the LightSpark project. Now there is the Raffle project. Problem is that Flash is very complex, and it's very difficult to get it right. For example, Gnash has been around for a lot of time, and you couldn't run everything on it. And also, LightSpark was even beyond Flash in compatibility, but also that one has its limitation. So uh, I don't know uh, how Raffle is going, but uh, yeah, we, we think that uh, it will never be uh, exactly the same as uh, the Flash, uh, the original Flash player. And this technology is also general. So we, right now we have a concrete application that is saving Flash this year, because it's going away this year. Uh, but we can reuse all this stuff to make other things too. So we think that this is a better use of our, ta our, of our time instead of re-implementing Flash yet another time and maybe not getting it right. <laughs> nope. There you go. Um, I guess to follow up on that, um, does this mean you're running old Flash code and do you have to like re-implement or run Windows or be in the back end? I mean, how does that work if you're, <laughs> are, are you using like, you know, the original Flash code over an OS like Windows running under your layer, so or the, how is that? The Linux, it's the Linux binary. Oh, it's the Linux yeah. flash binary, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and I guess my other question was, um, I'm also interested in old DOS emulation, so I was wondering how oh, yeah, that's cool. far along you are in that. Like, for example, can I just take like a disk image with MS-DOS in a game or something and just stick it in there and it'll just boot on it and run it? Or yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and how far along is the hardware emulation? Uh, for, for the virtual machine, I mean, you know, like 
all the video modes supported or like how far along is yeah that? uh so i'm not sure where we are actually on i think that most those stuff works but yeah um I'm not sure what's the current but, state of things uh, on that side. Yeah, we can run Pro Story. I would like to test this. I, I don't know uh, how far <laughs> can we go right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I do some yeah, that, that is a cool stuff, but yeah, right now we are more focused on, on the other. And hopefully the, the shared part, that is the, the JIT engine and the x86 uh, execution, that is the same. So there is, uh, yeah. I, I want to talk to you later because I do some <laughs> uh, contract work for internet archive and we have the large DOS collection of games. So on, it runs in a browser. So I just, yeah, talk to you later. Questions. Can you play, can you play doom? Hmm? Can you play doom on it? Oh, we didn't try actually, but uh... yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the ultimate emulator test. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Yeah, well, we start with more with the price. Uh, <laughs> Spa's good. Uh, any last questions? Oh. I mean, I'm not sure if it's really a question, but have you seen at WebAssembly Summit there was a speaker who converts WebAssembly to Flash? Have you tried connecting that to your Sorry, compilers? I didn't, I didn't get it. Like at WebAssembly Summit there was a speaker who converts WebAssembly to Flash files. So you can probably convert Flash back to WebAssembly if I run on WebAssembly oh, yeah, in your yeah, WebAssembly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think about it. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs>